recording. Hi, we have David Johnson, uh, a prepucial amputee or a circumcision uh, victim like me. And uh, we're going to go through another interview uh, where we go through all the harms uh, that we believe, or that David, in this case, believes uh, is, has been inflicted on him, what, how he's been impacted by the fact that his prepuce has been um, removed from him as, an, as a child. So say hi, David. <laughs> hello, hello. Sorry, I was just shutting the door real quick. All right. Okay. Hello. Oh. All right, let's get started. Okay. So um, the, the first major section that we always cover on these interviews is the physical um, aspects. Sure. And, um, I, I bring this up because it's regularly brought, brought up when like protesting or whatever or, or uh, complaining about it online. It's like, well, why is it bad? Um, okay, well, here's why it's bad. Like, listen to these, you know, all these men that have figured it out. Um, you know, for my instance, myself, I've figured it out by, you know, doing a lot of studying, asking in tech men, um, talking, you know, to men that got cut later on in life and all that, um, how the normal penis works. So uh, one of the first terms is uh, is acropostion. And if you look at one of my videos uh, in YouTube, it goes way back with uh, John Geisker from uh, Doctor's Supposed Circumcision making a presentation. He, one of the images that he shows on the screen at a baby fair is an image of a Greek um, statue showing the penis with the part of, you know, what you might consider the foreskin um, rather than the, you know, overall prepuce that covers the entire glance, but just the part that hangs off of the end uh, of the penis. And uh, it's, it's, it's known to have, um, Features like uh, allowing stuff out, but not back in. So it acts like a sphincter. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, and it does that through uh, kind of some musculature in the, in the skin um, that's often referred to as the dartus fascia. So I'm, from what I've gathered, David, with you, uh, I was just, I just finished listening to uh, most of your intact radio session. Uh, you've had more than just your acropostion removed. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's complete um, foreskin removal. Okay. Do you know what your coverage index is? Uh, I mean, I started restoring maybe a year ago or so. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was like at a, like a one. So now maybe okay. it's like a two or a three at, at best. Okay. Well, yeah. right. congratulations. You're making some progress. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, I always like to use my my mock penis here. Um, I, I consider myself like having like a zero to one. It's kind of funny how the coloring is um, happening because it's been sitting in my pocket, so it's like you see a blue line there. But um, you know, this part is the inner mucosa, and then you've got your shaft skin here, right? And uh, I still have my inner mucosa, and I think what happened was back then. They were probably using Mogan clamp uh, to the bell, um, like the plastic bell or the um, yeah, Domco clamp. So I ended up keeping my inner mucosa. So I don't want to stretch that part. I want to stretch this part down here. <laughs> and uh, the tools aren't really good at doing that. I mean, it, the the restoration tools, like you, know, you can try to grab that and pull on it. Um, to try to stretch this part, but um, what you're doing is, if you're just pulling up on that, you're also pulling up on your scrotum, so you're not really getting a whole lot of stretching there. You need to kind of do a, this <laughs> kind of stretching, right? Yeah. Um, you mind if I ask you what tool you're using for restoration? Uh, the TLC. TLC Tugger. Tugger. Yeah. The Ron Lowe invention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's a great guy. I love. Uh, watching yeah, his cool. his uh his videos and the music that he's put together stuff like that yeah so he's a great guy all right so uh the next thing is a uh, sensitive skin so uh based on what you've been talking about i 
assuming that you do fully believe that what was removed is sensitive skin. It did have uh, several, lots of nerves. <laughs> I'm not going to stick to specific numbers like 20,000 nerves or whatever. I don't care if it's only on her nerves. It was my, they were my nerves. They shouldn't have been removed. <laughs> yeah. So. Right. Yeah, well, like what I think, um, and also what my friend also noticed too, which I think most men do, is that the most sensitive part of your circumcised penis is the scar itself. Well, not the, not the scar, but this, this tiny bit of leftover foreskin that's that's there so that is the most sensitive part so just logically you can assume that the rest of it was also extremely sensitive yeah no, it's no just kidding. from like firsthand experience i guess you could say yeah um and for me i i think do you have any idea what you were cut with or was it with a bell method or i actually have no idea Okay. Do you Honestly. do you know how much intermucosa you have? Because I've seen guys with just like a very like just uh, centimeters. Just a very thin uh, line. Okay, so you were probably cut with some sort of bell method then. Yeah. When, when you think when you think about when, when they put a bell down over your glands and then they cut right at the base of the bell, then that leaves you know then they're yeah. taking off all of that intermucosa yeah. and and uh, outer shaft skin so you end up with more shaft skin right. um, rather than instead of, you know what they mogan clamp what they're doing is they're they pull up on the foreskin and then they just they try to clamp right on top right above the glands um which sometimes with bad um performers they end up um, squeezing that clamp too low and then that ends up cutting into the glands itself yeah so what you might call it a botch. Uh, so for me, the uh, the frenular, because I do have my intermucosa, I think my frenular area is what is my most sensitive area. So mm. in, in that way, I consider myself lucky. But yeah. on, uh, on the other side, I have such a, a very, very tight cut. Um, I It mm. causes other problems, and I'll cover that um, as we go through this. Uh, so glands protection. Uh, so I'm assuming that since you're getting a little more coverage, your um, your your glands is covered a little more often, and maybe you're regaining some um, yeah. softness or whatever. They're much more sensitive now. Like I can't sleep without it on. Like I can't do anything without it on anymore. It's just too. It's very uncomfortable if I take it off at all. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I heard. Um, uh, someone else used the manhood and he said that he he like wants to leave the manhood on all the time because his gland yeah i use that again. Too, when i'm not wearing the, the tlc yeah yeah that, that scares me to even um try the manhood myself because i don't want to become dependent on it i mean it's, it's almost like becoming dependent on a drug so yeah yeah i mean it's not the, it, it doesn't really like make your glands more pleasurable. It just kind of makes it more sensitive, I guess. Yeah. But it, it does start to soften up at some point. But yeah, I think it would probably, if you took it off and just let it, let the abrasion come back, it wouldn't take long for it to get back to see the way it was before. Okay. Do you mind me asking uh, how old you are? I'm um, 28. 28. Okay. Yeah. So you haven't had as many years as I have for your um, glands to keratinize, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it it does it does get worse as you get older slowly. Yeah. It's really interesting how it happens at you know yeah a very slow rate. But okay, uh, rolling mechanism. What what are your thoughts about that? The rolling mechanism. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, it provides lube, I guess. Uh, as I've restored more, like I, it's, it's more pleasurable when you have that rolling because it's just less the less friction. Yeah, uh, well, I, I often, I often do it. Let's see if I can 
do this here properly. It's like I, I I'll show I try to show this. I, I did another video too where I, I stuck a um, a piece of a rubber glove on my on my finger and then I doubled it up. Um, I put some tape on my, my the tip of my finger first so that would act like the glands and I stuck the whole thing on my finger yeah. and then I doubled it up so it looked like kind of like a foreskin and then I you know do this with it so yeah. like if you hold your fist and you try to just stick your finger in between your fist it's really hard to get it in there but when I put a little Vaseline on and then I doubled up that that glove it's like you can't keep it from going in it's 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 it, uh, it slides in a lot easier right right, right. um and you know this kind of because it's it's showing the how it unrolls that's the rolling mechanism part um that makes um entry especially the you know the first entry um right you know a whole lot easier because there's no you're, you're taking away the friction you're you're acting like a rolling bearing right it's just unrolling in yeah. the inside um, you know, whatever it is that you're going, <laughs> going into with your penis. So, well, plus the other thing is that when you're cut, especially really tight, uh, when you get an erection, it, it can be very painful because there's not, there's no slack skin left. Yeah. So that's another thing. And yeah. That's what helps. That's what helps with restoring too. Like, even if you're not making like a ton of progress or you're not like, getting full coverage at least you can kind of reduce some of the pain because yeah you can even a little bit of extra slack skin can help uh reduce some of the pain yeah and i cover that um as we get down to the testes and the pelvic floor yeah. a little bit too about where the, the pain occurs uh if you have a tight cut um so the rolling mechanism is a little separate from the from the moisture lube part because the mm -hmm. um the inner mucosa of the penis, you know, it's like the inner mucosa of lots of body parts. There's stuff in there that creates secretions that keeps things moist, right? right. So it's supposed to be moist. So like, uh, maybe not as much as a say a vagina, but it does, you know, it, it does keep things moist and smooth and soft inside. So you got the rolling mechanism on top of the lubrication. So you're adding lubrication to the the act. Um, and certain intact men could, you know, attest to that too, about how it's valuable to have both of those for sexual activity. So I'm assuming you have no moisture lube um, on your penis when you have an erection and you start having sexual activity. No, I've used coconut oil. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, olive oil is one that I like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, you could, you know, give money to companies like KY Jelly and stuff like that. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't like those companies at all. I don't like their products. Uh, well they, they yeah. I I, I kind of wonder if they have any involvement in um those who try to keep uh circumcision alive because it could cut into their money, you know, their their profits <laughs> if uh if there are fewer men that need it. Yeah. Um, okay, so then the frenulum, it sounds like your frenulum was ablated. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think uh, when I was listening to you, the intact radio, you were saying that uh, you were kind of identifying well with Carter uh, Steinoff that you, uh, you you lack, you think that there should be a lot more sensation there than than you feel. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. I, I kind of, I, I, I feel bad for those that got cut with the bell um, methods. And it, it's kind of funny to deal with some parents that will rave about oh, all that they had, you know, all that happens is that this bell thing falls off and, and it's great and it's done and over with or whatever. It's like, do you understand what you just, what you did to your child? <laughs> Anyhow. Yeah, I, I'm not completely aware of all, like, I didn't realize that different methods kept certain parts and didn't keep other parts. I didn't. Yeah, it, well, I knew yeah, it, it, it hasn't been talked about a lot. Um, there's, yeah. I haven't seen any videos actually compare 
the methods even like uh you know to medical doctors or whatever and say oh well you're a medical doctor you're going to do circumcisions and well here's your options you can do a gumco clamp mocha clamp or plastibel or or a shang ring or or freehanded or whatever and here's the pros and cons of all of them i haven't ever seen anything like that. i don't think the doctors even know yeah. I, I don't think they do either i i <laughs> I think they probably, I think it's probably like the pharmaceutical um, companies. They probably have some um, representative go see them when uh, they're, you know, in college or whatever, say, here, buy this gumco clamp and do your circumcisions that way. Here's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than being taught by a teacher or whatever. They probably just use whatever method that they learned in uh, college or whatever. Just yeah. Stick with that. Uh, hang on a second. Oh, yeah. I, I was sent one. Oh, that's not it. Um, someone sent me a Gumpco clamp or two, and um, it's kind of in the shuffle somewhere from the move. And I've been wanting to make a video or two with it, but um, yeah. yeah, I have to find it <laughs> again. So yeah, I, I probably will do another video that talks more about the differences and how it affects the male. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Yeah. I, like you said, I don't think there's too much information about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next thing is hairy shaft or uh, scrotal webbing. Do you? Um, have that? I have a little hair up on my shaft, but okay. not too far up. Okay. So um, I don't know how. Uh, I don't. I don't know how much circumcision has affected that or how normal that is yeah so. um is it pretty clear the line between your scrotum and your um shaft skin because for me it, it's pretty uh, clear line yeah yeah i would say so yeah so i mean the idea is is um, although when i am tugging it does kind of pull up on the scrotal skin yeah yeah so your scrotal skin is going up onto your onto your shaft yeah um, yeah and, and you if you i don't know if you look at porn at all but um i've watched enough to notice a clear difference between intact men and not and where the yeah. where the scrotum mm -hmm. you, you kind of have to sit there and look at it in, in detail and all that and you know i'm at this point i'm not looking at porn to get turned on i'm looking at porn to try to understand you know yeah, how right. things work down there <laughs> yeah and i, I think uh, very few men uh, or maybe even women um, take the time to look at it from a scientific or, perspective. Or doctors. <laughs> yeah, because they're probably afraid of being called, uh, you know, I don't know, gay or pervert or whatever. Or perv or whatever. Yeah, exactly. That actually really bothers me, like that type of attitude. It's just, I don't understand it. Like, it's like a, um, it's like you're scared of basic information. And I just, I don't really get it. Like, there's nothing to be scared of it's just you know yeah. there's this um youtuber called caitlin v that yeah. uh talks about sex a lot um there's also um another lady um she runs a channel called sexplanations um, but caitlin v just put out one recently about how you know um red flags with your partner and one of them was uh, if your partner can't talk about sex in a mature way then <laughs> that's a red flag <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah yeah okay uh so testes is the next thing um for me my testes when i was younger um particularly in my teens and my 20s when i get an erection my testes would get pulled up um, by because my scrotum is getting pulled up, right? Um, it, my testes get drawn up inside of my body, and um, and things would get a little tight, and my testes yeah. would get squeezed just a little bit. And it's almost like getting kicked in the nuts. Uh, I'm older now; things are stretched out down there a little bit. I mean, it's normal, just like boobs. You know, they kind of go with gravity. So I don't have that trouble so much anymore. But uh, what what about you? Uh, yeah, I would say similar to you. Like, really? Yeah. I think that's kind of normal. But, um, yeah, I, I've had, I've done a few interviews now and it's varied. Some have and some don't. 
yeah so, again it just it depends on how you get cut you know and you know it's it's also yeah you, you can they could they might angle the the cutting tool this way or this way or whatever and that might have a different effect on whether right. it affects your pelvic floor or whether it affects your scrotum right so. yeah and it's crazy it's, how how it affects so so far down and they i think it's just a little snip but it's it's just Every little thing will have permanent effects on it. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's hard to know when you were cut as a child, but it's, it's really hard to know like what's what's what, you know. Yeah. Okay, pelvic floor. Do you understand what I'm talking about with a uh, pelvic floor? Yeah, the PC muscle. Yeah. Well, so for me, what happens, oops, I guess we should keep it um, circumcised here. Um, so if you look at uh, medical diagrams that shows the um, the corpus cavernosa, which is the part that fills up with blood, that corpus cavernosum goes all inside, all the way inside your body, all yeah. the way back to your anus, right? Right. And so it fills up with blood. And if the skin doesn't allow for your penis to go outside of your body properly, um, then the skin gets a little tight, and your your penis goes up like this. <laughs> Which yeah. it can be a little funny because you can, you know, you can, you know, I, I, I used to be able to, I think I probably still do it. I, I can, I can control how my corpus cavernosum is full, filled up and, and relaxed, fill up and relax, kind of like a muscle. Um, and I can make my penis like slap my, my, my belly. <laughs> yeah. But it's also very uncomfortable because it, it does this and then your partner tries to do this or whatever and, and that skin. gets uncomfortable um, particularly yeah. right where it, it comes out of the body because it's, it's doing a double angle thing yeah right. so uh for you pelvic floor, yeah I don't, it doesn't pop up like that it's, it seems just straight okay yeah it doesn't it doesn't pop up uh it, it doesn't it's not my skin is not tight enough to where it, it goes up in that angle yeah I think, but okay. uh, uh Did you ever have an ex um, experience with that? Um, what is that exactly? So, um, it it varies a little bit, but um, the meatus is the part is where the is at the very tip where the urine comes out, right? Yeah, and it's very common for bibucal amputees, circumcised boys to end up with this where um, kind of like a skin bridge or the narrowing of that area occurs. So yeah. it makes it harder for the urine to get out. For me, yeah. I had a little skin bridge across and that would cause my, my urine to spread out, spray like this. When you um, were a kid or when you were a baby? Yeah, when I, I think I was like seven or eight years old. I, I do fun. remember going to the doctor for this and do remember the doctor doing just a little slice to, to fix it. It wasn't really painful or anything, um, but I, I I believe that I still have a certain level meatosis where the end is just closed up a little bit, so it, I get a little bit of a sharp feeling when I urinate right at the tip. Yeah, no, I don't have that. I've never had that. Okay. Skin bridges. Are you familiar with those? Um, it's where like the skin tries to reattach itself. Yeah, yeah to the glands. Yeah, because. Um, as you probably have learned by this point, yeah. that uh, you know the the intermucosa is supposed to be attached to the glands during childhood. Right. right. So your body tries to reattach, or yeah. sometimes it does, not all of them. Just, just like a scar, right? Yeah. Your, your body tries to re, you know, repair yeah. itself, and well, you don't want that doing a repair because it repairs in the wrong way because then it permanently yeah. reattaches to the glands. And then you have this, yeah. you know, skin going from your intermucosa all up to your uh, somewhere on your glands. Yeah, uh, I've I, I've had uh, like one guy talk about how he had to use a he has to use a Q-tip to clean in between his mm -hmm. um, his skin bridge. The skin bridge. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've never had that. I feel like that happens more when they leave a little more skin on. Yeah. Uh, there's like a little more skin to reattach itself to. I think if they cut it too tight, I don't think there's any skin left to even make a bridge. 
but yeah, that's, maybe I don't, I don't know. I, yeah. I really, it it's also depends on how well it's taken care of too, right? You're supposed to put Vaseline or whatever cream on um, that's true. for so long after that's true. Um, after the baby is cut or the child is cut yeah. or whatever. Um, yeah. All depending on the age, and uh, it, it's funny how a lot of people say, "Well, it's it's better to get done when you're a baby." It's like, well, actually, really? you have this extra problem when when you get it done as a baby, you have to deal with this. <laughs> Hey, don't when you're an adult the, the parents can't watch the baby 24 7 and they gotta sleep and yeah it's like when it's your own body you can kind of keep an eye on it all the time so. yeah for sure and when you when you're when it's your own body you're most likely a, a you know an adult and you don't have your your enemy because it is already separated from the gland so you don't it, it doesn't matter right so it's not you're not going to get a skin bridge um, as an adult. So. ED, erectile dysfunction. Yeah, um, I think as a circumcised man, it's much harder to get an erection. It takes a lot more effort. And depending on some people, they can't even orgasm or anything because of their circumcision so bad. Yeah, I heard uh, you talking about that on the yeah. show. Um, so I guess it's just all, it's, it all depends on your own body and stuff. But uh, for me, I feel like it takes a little bit more effort than it should. Uh, just because there's only very small portions that have the sensitivity to create that, uh, that arousal. So um, yeah, and then also as you get older, it gets more, it gets harder and harder. So and that's what I talk about a lot too. Is, um, a lot of the trauma and stuff of circumcision is not does not um, come up until you're more sexually active. You know, it could be till your twenties or, or late twenties or early thirties before you really, really uh, start to realize, yeah, uh, the, the value of it. So yeah, and you have to you have to be told or you have to be you have to have it explained to you how. Yeah, I was 35 before I even started looking into this. Um, so that's when I yeah. became a dad of a boy. And it took me a dozen years of researching and um, inner. I'm an introvert normally. And so I processed it internally, quietly, pretty much by myself. I just ask questions to try to understand things and learn a little bit more and then kind of go back into myself and go through the stages of grief and all that. And it's, it wasn't like I had to go through stages of grief once. Um, I had to go through stages of grief over and over again because I kept learning more and more losses. And that's why I created right. this, this list of harms. And uh, so hopefully people can just get it over with all at one time. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Uh, I, I, um, I, I hate uh, what some people call black pilling um, men about this because I, I don't want them to get all depressed and everything about their loss. But at the same time, if men don't complain, then this continues to happen. Yeah, to I think uh, my thoughts is that it's it's a really selfish act not to get educated. However traumatizing it is. Yeah. Um, maybe it's better for you, but it's like you're continuing the, the suffering. So... That's the way I look at it. Sure. But at the same time, you have to provide uh, support for the people who are suffering from the trauma too. I think that's also important. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, general botches. Do you do you feel that you were botched in any way? I mean, I mean, I feel like I was cut really, really tight. Um, kind of an interesting story with the doctor but i won't go into it um, okay well we actually do talk about um doctor patient relationships down the way here so i'm sure it'll come up then <laughs> yeah okay yeah that'll it'll there's it, a pretty funny story actually so okay uh okay so the next section is about uh, partners and i understand you have a wife yeah okay so you're heterosexual yes so, um, do you, have you and your wife talked about how it affects her? Uh, yeah, we're very open uh, 
psychically and talk about everything. I trust her with everything. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it depends on the woman, but uh, I think women don't necessarily focus on uh, the physical as much as men necessarily. Yeah. They're more um, just emotionally, it's more important for them to be emotionally open with the man uh for their sexual life like uh, that's more important than the physical but um well you know they say the brain is the biggest uh sexual organ right yeah <laughs> so for, for she always just says well i think the foreskin is for the man you know not the woman and so she she tries to like not no i, I know what you're saying but my point is that she tries to say like uh, it's not up to me to decide you know what a man should have and not have. like that should be there like it's our responsibility to to protect our sons and all that, like, because that's that's our organ, right? Yeah. Like, well, I'm never going to understand everything about the vagina. They're never going to understand everything about the penis. So, um, and that's kind of the way. Uh, I, I've heard plenty of women talk about you know experiencing both and you yeah know, pros and cons of both or whatever. Yeah, but I do. But me personally, I think it's better for the man and the woman. I think it's much I think it would be much better for the woman so uh, not only does it bother me that I'm missing pleasure but it bothers me that the potential that she's also missing uh, pleasure too that also bothers me yeah but luckily it doesn't seem to affect you that much so okay all right so the next section is psychological <clears throat> it uh it sounds like from your talks on the radio with uh, intact radio with Jordan that uh, you do feel a certain level of trauma about this. Um, so, and there's yeah. there's true there's trauma not just from when you were cut, but there's also trauma from discover the discovery process about the loss. Right, right. I think there's kind of two. I like to kind of separate it into two different categories. Like one, the the first category is like the early the early onset PTSD, which I think needs to be studied a lot more. Like mm -hmm. when you do, uh, when, a, when a newborn baby or early developed child is traumatized, uh, it, it creates um, certain habits, behaviors, all sorts of problems that I think need to be researched more. And then, and then there's the second part of it was the, like the conscious part of it where you learn all the information and then you consciously are going through a lot of the trauma yeah so i, I kind of think there's two two different um sections that need to be dealt with if that makes sense yeah and i think i think the early onset trauma is very hard uh, the most difficult to deal with because you don't know what the trauma caused because well if you're older and you experience a traumatic event you have a before and you have an after but because the trauma happens so early you feel that that's always been a part of you uh, so you don't know uh well is that just my personality is that just my brain is that just how i am yeah. or was that caused by this trauma and that was a problem with my friend too like he felt like he had a very intense feeling that a lot of his problems were caused by that. But because you, you can't logic, uh, logically know, you can't prove it, it, it's a very hard thing to deal with and cope with. So, yeah. And it's also hard for other people to understand when you're seeking help. So, yeah. Uh, Some because, men have reported, uh, including myself, um, nightmares from yeah. during childhood. Yeah. Um, did you have any of those that you think that are attributed? Uh, I have nightmares now, but um, <laughs> uh, no, I, my childhood was seemingly normal. Okay. Uh, all, but when I hit puberty, that's when all hell just broke loose for me. Like, I had a, a ton of uh, drug problems, just confidence problems, social problems. I, I forget to I ask, when did you start learning about the loss? Um. So I, uh, like I've, I had an uncircumcised friend growing up, a couple of them. So I knew like, I knew uh, their penis was different than mine, but I never really thought much of it. And growing up, I just thought, circum I didn't think my penis was 
I didn't know there was a scar there. Like, I didn't know that was a scar. I just thought it was normal. That's how it looked. Yeah. Um, and then maybe like five or six years ago, I read the article where the doctors were doing MRIs on mm -hmm. babies uh, before and then after they were circumcised. Yeah. And then it showed the, the alteration of their brain chemistry. Uh, and then I, I was just like, I immediately knew, okay, well, that's wrong. Like, and I knew I went through that and I knew that it probably had an effect on me, but I kind of just like brushed it under the rug. I didn't go into it much. And then about three years ago, my friend started calling me every day and he's like, you got to watch, um, you got to watch, you know, these videos, Bloodstained Man, you got to watch uh, Eric Clopper's video. Yeah. And I told him, because I knew he was struggling with depression. I'm like, uh, I don't, like, I know that it's wrong, but I don't think you should um, focus on it too much. Mm -hmm. But uh, he just, he kept, he like was really adamant about it. So kind of just to like try to support him, I got into it, uh, got, got ed more educated. Yeah. And then as I got more educated, uh, that kind of sparked my own anger and trauma mm -hmm. and all that stuff. That's kind of like how, how it all went down. And then from there, I just, I got obsessed. I had to learn everything as much as I could about it, you know? Okay. And then now I'm kind of to a place where I have to like uh, purposely not expose myself to it too much because uh, I'd have to like balance my life out a bit. That yeah, makes sense. yeah I, I hear you. It's, it's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's hard to for me to keep my mind off of this and to yeah me too that's why I, I have to like do, I have to have activities and stuff to get my mind off of it otherwise it's yeah. just too much to deal with all of that yeah and you were saying I think in in touch radio um you know like have someone to take care of so you can focus on them for a while and yeah um, I think that's important because if if you're only internalizing all of your own suffering and pain all the time yeah um. It kind of sucks you into this black hole yeah. where um, you have no joy. And that's when suicide starts to creep up on you because there's yeah. just nothing to live for anymore. So I think trying to have healthy relationships, having animals or anything that can help you have pur give you purpose and meaning is important. Yeah, I had a thought about that, though, because my um, advocacy work or intactivism um, is a way of taking care of someone else. Um, yeah. I, I, doing intactivism isn't about me. That's it's right. About, you know, the next yeah. generation I'm trying to protect. Right. Yeah. Well, what I'm talking about is your day-to-day -day internal uh, trauma that you're going yeah. through. Whereas in fact, oftentimes when you deal with that trauma and you become healthier and more capable mentally, you'll do better in activist work, right? Because you'll be more prepared and mentally stable yeah. to um, educate people properly. I, I personally go through that uh, sometimes. In fact, I just had a, an episode um, earlier today, actually. Um, I was thinking about autonomy. Um, I, I think that everyone needs a certain level of autonomy um, in their lives, right? They, they need to be, be able to make their own decisions about what they get to eat or what they wear or, um, you know, where they might live or, or whatever. You need to be able to have some choices. This is one choice that is taken away from you and it's forever. Yep. You know, and when I thought about that, um, and I just let that sink in for a while, I just an extreme level of sadness overwhelmed me for a little while and i had to snap out of it <laughs> it's like, yeah yeah uh, i'm gonna really sink your <laughs> right you know, hard so, um so yeah. yeah suicide is the next thing that we're we're going to cover here and under psychological and and you kind of address some of it and you were talking about how your friend committed suicide after um after having lots of discussions with him about um being a prepucial amputee yeah yeah so, it's not necessarily so, the only factor but that might make someone commit suicide but it seems like it's certainly a, a strong factor yeah absolutely uh, i think 
there's so much there's so much that you can talk about with that um i think the damage that it causes to your relationships your ability to connect the physical the physical damage probably is the worst the worst aspect of it um so like for me after going through this process the the worst part of it is the the left the physical part that i'm missing although there was many 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 years and every single day i'm dealing with the psychological impact of it which is also equally as devastating in, in many ways yeah. um and on top of that it's it's uh it affects your relationships it gives you like you said, when you have that, when you have your bodily autonomy ripped from you, it creates a framework in your life uh, that you don't deserve to feel joy, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it not only can rob you of your sexual joy, but of uh, things that just normal day-to-day -day activities that should be enjoyable as well. Yeah. So I think all of those things on top of trying to reach out to people and being rejected consistently on a consistent basis um, <clears throat> kind of builds the potential for someone to commit suicide. Yeah. Um, yeah that's I, kind I, of think, the, I, I agree. I, I think that is, um, it, it's not just the fact that you're an amputee, um, but the fact that you're, that your harm is not being acknowledged by so many people especially yeah. your you know your family and friends uh if you end up losing friends or family or you become uh, like back sheep of the family or whatever because you're speaking out about it um that just gives you even more reason to just say well fuck it <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. um, you know yeah. what 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 point is you know yeah. living if i'm not going to be loved by my family and that you know, yeah my family and friends aren't going to um listen to my pain and support me yeah um, and that's kind of what i have to say about suicide although like there you could go down a, a lot of different topics with that and yeah. everyone's different sure. so it's it's always hard to pinpoint like well why exactly did this happen on that day you know why did he choose to do it now like it, it just it's this kind of black hole that suck, it keeps draining you to the point where um, you just, you, you can't cope anymore. You have no more coping mechanisms left. Yeah. And it just, that's the, that's your final uh, act that you can do for yourself. So one of the things I try to do um, is frame it like a war wound. Um. <laughs> I was, yeah. I, I, I entered a war right out of the womb <laughs> yeah. and I got a, you know, I got a war wound. And, it's like uh, the worst day of your life. What? That was the worst day of your life. Exactly. There's nothing, there's nothing worse that can possibly happen to you. So yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. So, you know, I, I talk about my war wound and, you know, it's like, yeah. I got shot right here and I was in this war for this reason or whatever. Yeah. And I'm proud for fighting the war, you know, fighting the war valiantly. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't a very good fighter then. <laughs> I'm a good fighter now. Yeah. And one thing I would want to encourage and talk to this too is that sometimes it can be depressing that you don't get any support. But that is all the more reason why we need to be strong and do this work because nobody else is going to do it. We're the only people who are going to do it. So it's it's super important that we keep going. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and uh, you know, on that line, it's uh, you know, there's intactivists that have been doing this for decades that are yeah. you know, passing away, uh, like Rosemary Romberg back in January, and uh, we need to we need to pass the baton. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So we need new blood. Yeah. All right. So the next thing is uh, children. Um, 
trying to drawing a blank right now how s- psychological and children fit together with all this. Do you have any thoughts? As psychological and children, like anything more specific? Um, you know, maybe I need to write down some notes about the children aspect of this, but um, like how it affects a child. Or... Well, you were talking about having a friend that was or friends that were intact when you were a child, and um, yeah. So, um, and you were talking a little bit about how that affected you then. Um, I don't know. I, I don't. Know. I'm drawing a blank on that. I I don't think being intact like makes you immune to trauma i still think traumatic events uh can affect your life um, oh yeah i think it prepare i think it makes it easier for you to to cope with trauma you know now i'm now i'm remembering um why this why this comes up um one of the excuses quite often in the um circumcision bingo <laughs> is oh your child is going to be bullied yeah were you bullied but did you did yeah. you bully anyone that was intact yeah you like did? why are, do kids should kids really be running around looking at each other's penises anyway like is that really the most normal like i mean i, I know it happens but it's like yeah <laughs> how often is that gonna happen yeah it, it, i there was one day i uh, chaperoned with my son's class for a pool day. Yeah. And because I had the best um, background check of all the um, men that volunteered to chaperone, I was specifically asked to monitor the changing room by myself. So I had all these boys um, and they're trying to change and some were intact, some were not. One boy was bullied. Hmm. but I don't think it had anything to do with his penis, honestly. Hmm. I mean, he was naked, um, but he fell. And uh, part of it was that a lot of the boys were standing in line to try to get changed, and they were trying to change inside of a, um, install, inside of the stalls. There were only two stalls. It's like, guys, just change. It's no big deal. You know, it's like you all have the same parts. It's, yeah. <laughs> you know? Get out your shorts and put on some clothes and get it done over with. But they all wanted to stay online so they can have some privacy. And while this one slightly larger boy got in there and he leaned up against the door, and I was just on the side of the door, and the door popped open and he fell on his butt. And all the boys, you know, they were always kind of picking on beforehand. And uh, then they, you know, laughed at him and, and harassed him and all that. All this, all the while, my boy was by himself more. He wasn't like in the crowd and he didn't care about privacy and he's intact and he's changing and no one's even paying any attention to him so <laughs> uh, and my boys have no have said that they have never been bullied about their penis so yeah so i was just kind of uh, so the reason why i bring up the children part in the psychological thing is is particularly um how mm-hmm. they might be Affected uh, um, during childhood. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next one is medical professionals. Um, I don't assume you're, you're a medical professional here, right? Uh, I mean, I'm not a professional, but both of my parents are doctors, so yeah. I've kind of grown up in that. So yeah, I think you talked a little bit about that because you said that your that your do- your parents have a good bit of influence on this. Um, so I what I think about is I've heard plenty of reports from medical professionals. Marilyn Minus is one of the most notorious uh, because she got fired um, because she was basically against this practice on baby boys. Mm-hmm. Um, so being working in a place where this is happening when you're against it i just can't i couldn't personally do it um i i'm uncomfortable going into hospitals as it is but i will when i need to or if my family needs to be cared for uh, one time i dropped off my mother yeah i dropped off my mother and off for an mri or whatever and i 
they didn't necessarily want me to be in there with her because of the pandemic and everything like that. It's like, so I brought all my blood stained pants and went out to the corner and protested while she was <laughs> That is funny. That's more entertaining than just sitting around. Yeah. <laughs> I got, uh, I got plenty of, um, medical professionals coming out of the building and are walking across the street or whatever and like uh, asking what this is all about and everything so uh anyways That's fine. So well, have, your, have your parents talked at all about how they feel about this uh, they're veterinarians so oh okay it's not like they're were they weren't involved they never circumcised a human before so themselves so that kind of i don't know makes it a little bit easier for me to, to cope with, I guess. Yeah. But I, I just think the medical professionals are just so uneducated on so many things. And yeah. you get this have, the textbooks, it's, it's really sad. They have no incentive to become educated. Yeah. They're, they're incentivized to stay ignorant. So I think that's just a big, big problem. Yeah. And when, I, when you try to bring up new information to them, they have bigger fish to fry. Like it's just, there's no, there's no reason for them to waste their time unless they actually care and actually want to do the right thing. But a lot of them just, they don't think about it. Yeah, earlier last year, 2020, I, I went through a 2020 edition of a urology book and identified it's clearly slanted toward you know, circumcision. And they use the word circumcision a lot instead of post or prefusional amputation or anything like that. Um, and so I, I wrote a, a huge letter, a nice thick letter, um, copying and pasting bits <clears throat> out of their book saying, well, here's, your, here's the problems with this and this and this and this. And I, then I'd reference um, studies and articles and stuff like that. So, um, and then I sent it, there were eight, eight editors of the book and I managed to find and, and emailed and got responses from um, seven out of eight um that they received the letter i never got any thank you or anything but uh, just mm -hmm. the, just a receipt that they did get it <laughs> so yeah it's it's really scary um to look at medical yeah. textbooks yeah. and see yeah. how much information is missing uh, particularly about genitalia and not just male genitalia uh, but female genitalia too there's a gal by the name of jessica penn you can look her up she's on um, twitter she's got a medium I think it's medium um, blog and everything like that about it. And uh, she even had a, um, a petition recently that looks like it's been quite pr um, productive um, trying to get the um, gynecologists to, uh, to improve the education system around um, the clitoris. So they, yeah. I mean, in some ways, um, as, as much as, uh, the medical textbooks are bad for the male genitalia. It's even worse from what it looks like for the female genitalia because they don't even have the nervous system outlined for the uh, for the clitoris. So and that's uh, and she got harmed from a surgery at age eighteen, uh, oh, wow. and she blames the lack of medical education on it. Yeah, the doctors opposing circumcision has a really good video on the just the basic anatomy of it. It's called like yeah. the the pre -fuse. Yeah, it's the information is out there, but whether the yeah. you know educational um, institutions are providing it or not is the other right. issue. Well, another problem too is that they they've kind of stolen the word circumcision because yeah, in ancient times, circumcision was never the amputation of the entire foreskin. Yeah, no. it was just a small cut. Yeah, at the end, and, and that's and that's what they called circumcision, and they they still call circumcision today. So, well, people think they're they're following the Bible or whatever, but that's that's not even what they practice. They could draw so, one dot, one drop of blood, and call it circumcision. Um, the word right, exactly. circumcised just means to cut in a circle. When you look at the roots, the Latin roots yeah. of it. So it, it's really, as far as I'm concerned, it's extremely unprofessional for medical professionals to use uh, that term at all. It's, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I, I call that out on Twitter all the time. You know, when people say talk about circumcision or circumcising or whatever, it's like, huh? Caught it in a circle? Your child? What? <laughs> what does yeah. that mean? Yeah. Oh, what, 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 I've got this gift that I made that... Uh, 
I don't ha I usually had it behind me on the wall, but it's just the general autonomy um, symbol that uh, mm -hmm. is um, in a circle, and I I cut the circle out, right? And it just says yeah. you know, circumcised paper. <laughs> circumcised paper. Yeah, exactly. Like, and when people talk about um, banning circumcision, it's like, I like cutting in circles. <laughs> so hopefully uh, that gets people thinking, it's like, huh? Okay, yeah, okay, I guess the word sucks. It's a bad, bad word. Yeah. Yeah, fix our, fix our verbiage, ver verbiage. That's why you say like pre prepuce amputation, how do you say it? Prepuce, yeah, because it's your prepuce that's being removed. Yeah. That's a uh, better, more yeah. accurate term. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the people that are pro pro cutters, they they're like, oh, you're you're just using that term to be, you know, uh, attention seeking. Yeah, you know? you're, to blow it up or whatever. It's like, no, it's, Not the, really. it's accurate. It's an it's accurate term. Specific. You're removing yeah. a body part permanently. That is an amputation. Yeah. That's no, an amputation is to remove a finger or arm or you know a limb or something like that. <laughs> Who says? <laughs> I, yeah. I I can I can accept postectomy because it's kind of like an appendectomy or you know a lot of other things that would be an ectomy or removing a body part. Yeah. So you know, if you want to use postectomy, okay, fine. I still like prepucial amputation better. Okay, so uh, the next thing under psychological is parent. Um, so, your parent? No. No. Okay, not yet. <laughs> um, how do you think your own parents um, have been psychologically impacted by this, or have you even talked to them much about uh, your? Uh, I mean, I've had some conversations with my mom about it. But uh, not much with my dad. Um, so, what's the question? How do I think they've been affected? Think by be, how do you think they're psychologically affected by uh, this practice? Well, I think it. I mean, there's no way around it. When you when you do something like that to a child, it's going to have consequences. Whether you accept that or you're aware of the consequences, I think. Um, it causes certain behavioral changes. This, like there's the studies with the brain chemistry changes forever. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of theory and that's why I think it needs to be researched more. So I could I could like speculate on stuff with my parents and stuff, but I don't really want to get into that. Yeah. Okay. But um, uh, it's since you're not a parent, maybe this doesn't really apply to you much, but just like no, it, you, you know, I think it applies. Sense. It's a, uh, yeah. Okay. I don't want to get too specific about anything. So. Yeah. 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 Um, and then the last one under psychological is the intact men. And since you're not intact, I don't know that applies to you. Um, I have had interviews with intact men and they yeah. know how they are psychologically impacted by this, even though they're not cut <laughs> because they live in, you know, a society or whatever, or they mm -hmm. are around, you know, fellow men that are, you know, it does psychologically affect them. They can feel pressured to get uh, yeah. circumcised. Yeah, I've heard of plenty of men that uh, said that they felt um, ashamed or whatever. Yeah, um, insecure about it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they they shouldn't be. They should not feel. Yeah, yeah. They should consider themselves lucky steps. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, so the next big section is relationships. Um, yeah. And the first part is child parent trust. Do you feel that you've uh, that your trust of your own parents have been a, has been affected by this? Yeah, I think that's that's a big that's a definitely a big problem. I think. Uh, Almost unavoidable, almost unavoidable, I think, when you become consciously aware of all the information and stuff. That, uh, that That's actually one of the biggest traumas and biggest horrors is not only did this horrible thing happen to me, but the people that I trusted most allowed that to happen to you. Yeah. 
And I think that that just that itself is very damaging to a lot of families and stuff. Um, it's affected my relationship a lot. Um, so I, I don't know. I think it's important to come to a place where you're not relying on your parents uh, emotionally anymore because when you do have that conversation with them, uh, if they don't respond in a positive way, it can really affect you. So that's why I think it's important to do stuff, things like this, where you're talking with somebody who is going to understand or some groups of people who will understand. Um, and then maybe you can approach your parents in a more uh, calm way because you're not relying on them to just to like coddle you. Yeah. I guess you could say, because the truth is, is if your parents let that happen to you, it's kind of unlikely that they're going to have all that much sympathy for you. Unless they're a regret parent or something, somebody, somebody who's really educated on the issue. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, what I realized with my parents is they actually need to be educated. Um, they actually need the, the basic anatomy, the basic psychological effects and, if you come at them with a with a very emotional um, uh, message, they're less likely to actually research mm -hmm. and get educated. They, they might I, just get defensive or whatever. They just get defensive. And what they really need is to just watch some videos on it with an open mind mm -hmm. and become educated. Um, but in terms of just the, the trust and bond, yeah, I think that is 100% affected and uh, it's a hard thing to, to, to deal with. Yeah, um, well, we get into the mother-child bond down here. Um, and all yeah. That. Um, so I, let me just tell you my story. Maybe I'll have some more thoughts. But um, I didn't really bring it up with my parents because I didn't really blame my parents. I mean, back in the 70s, there was little to nothing as far as information about, you know, how things work. And my, my own father was cut. And I think my grandfather was cut. Um, so it was, it was just a, it was a normal thing. Um, like 90 some percent were being cut. I was born in a um, naval hospital. Uh, so it was, I think it was routine. I don't even know if my parents even consented to it. Um, I haven't paid the money to dig up records or anything like that. But um, my nephew was about to be born and I wanted to talk to my brother about a topic. And I thought that'd be best to bring it up with him um, while having my parents in the room. So all four of us sat down around a table and I explained to them how, how, um, well, I, I first started out with my aim. What my aim was is to help my brother understand um, the topic better because it's something that I've been taught uh, studying and that you know my two sons were intact and this was a couple years ago so they were in their pre-teens early teens at this point and um and I, I tried to go into it as a very much non-blaming way because I, I wasn't again I wasn't really blaming my parents I I more blame the medical industry and I I blame it all the way back to you know whoever it was that came up with the idea of first freaking place to cut off parts of genitalia <laughs> yeah but yeah. uh you know and that got the ball rolling um and more so the medical industry in the u.s that really you know got wound up even more when they started acting like mcdonald's hey you want some fries with that <laughs> oh you want a circumcision with that you know um uh, you know your baby's just born hey you want to get them circumcised yeah sure why not <laughs> you know um the, mm -hmm. that's, that's the way it, it happens in this country because of yeah capitalism and all that but uh yeah i i wanted to explain to particularly to my brother and i knew my mother and dad would hear about all this too um and maybe they can have a little sympathy or whatever and maybe they'd back me up and and convince my brother to keep his son intact but um yeah, I just I just went through a lot like what we're doing here. Went through all the physical harms, particularly the um, myelosynthesis, which I was actually kind of surprised. My parents didn't remember me um, having that problem. Um, 
particularly because uh, partly i think because my grandmother was one that took me to the hospital to address mm -hmm. it i was staying with her for summer or whatever and um and it was just a matter of the, i guess there was a consent problem because my parents weren't there it was my grandmother instead but back then it was before HIPAA and all that so i don't know but somehow my parents didn't have any memory of the meal stenosis piece and i explained to them how you know tight directions and all that too so uh, my dad get a, did get a little defensive just a little bit but i was like no i'm not blaming you you don't need to be defensive about this um yeah yeah I just, I just want you to hear you know the impacts and hopefully yeah. maybe this will mean that you'll go forward um telling other people don't do this to your child it's not a good idea it was you yeah know, it was a bad idea yeah i think that's the that's about the healthiest way to go about it if you can handle that sort of conversation yeah. uh, focus on just educating and not blaming yeah because blaming will always cause defense um are you doing any honestly your nephew remain intact what's that did your nephew i remain don't know intact? i don't know you don't know i don't know oh wow you don't talk to your brother much. Mm. no mm. less and less these days mm. so uh, that that kind of goes back to the well we'll kind of get down to the friends and family part of it, but we were talking earlier about um <clears throat> yeah what were we talking about uh, um, we were talking about, I think, psychological uh, suicide. We were talking about suicide and how family members and friends kind of like depart or block you or whatever about because you're talking about this topic because it's taboo, or whatever. So, yeah. So we'll get down to the friends and family part and we'll talk more about that. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know, honestly, though, I. I don't think I trust that my parents would have done any research, though, even if I was born today. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. You know, I I think uh, Van Lewis and Ben Lewis were maybe protesting in 1969 or something like that before I was born, but of course my parents probably didn't see that. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But today with know. Brother K, Brother Saint Man, Cockfight, Intaction, and all these other organizations protesting and trying to spread information. Maybe I would have gotten to them today, but uh, I doubt it because, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, hopefully parents, young parents today are, you know, spending enough time on social media and stuff like that and are getting views of, of this. So, um, so today I think the child parent trust relationship thing will be a bigger issue than ever because today there's just yeah. no excuse not to right. about this topic yeah. before saying yes to a doctor, but a lot of people still appeal to the th authority of doctors. So if um, the doctor is pushing it, um, you know, parents likely yeah. to go to it. I, I think Intact America recently did a study about that. So about 94% of hospitals are pushing it and pushing it hard, you know, asking half a dozen times or, or so. Yeah. So, Okay, so uh, co-parenting, um, you're not a parent yet, so um, probably just skip on past that unless you have anything to say about it. No, I'm good. Okay. Mother-child bond, you did bring that up a little bit. You think that um, it does impact the mother-child bond? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know how much it impacted me as like a baby or a child, but because I'm not aware of any of that, but uh Certainly, when you become aware of it, uh, there's a huge trust issue that you have to either work through or or not. So, yeah, so it's kind of uh, it, it seems that uh, you know having there's a lot of studies and and um, ideas about the baby being attached to the mother right after birth. Um, skin to skin contact and uh, eye to eyes and all that stuff during the very first um, minutes, hours, and even early days um, to the mother. And my my own wife is actually a little upset because um, she she couldn't hold our oldest um, for her first 
a couple hours after he was born because she had to have a little repair work done. And uh, so I was the one holding our oldest, and he seems to have bonded to me hmm. a little bit more than his mom, hmm. uh, and more so than um, his younger brother did because his younger brother was with mom right away and stuck with her for a good while hmm. after. And, and there was a lot more mother child bonding time. And as, as I've said before, both of our sons are intact, so there wasn't any. Uh, the baby wasn't taken away for a period of time to get, you know, snip, snip or anything. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's all, often talk about how, you know, the baby comes back and the baby is lethargic or whatever. It won't, won't, um, won't breastfeed. Um, yeah. You know, Brother K even talks about how he didn't eat for, you know, a long time after he wow. was born. Um, mm -hmm. he got snipped right out of the womb. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. My parents haven't really told me anything about that. So, do you know how soon after you were snipped? I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming it was in the first day or, or two. Okay. Yeah. Because my mom was not in the hospital longer than like a day. So, probably the first or second day. Yeah. I've heard of them be, you know, trying to be so efficient about it. It's like sometimes I'll do it right there in the delivery room. Baby out, snip, snip. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not just cut the cord, but you know, cut that part down there on the penis too. Get it over with. And, and just then about. Over mom. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want you staying in the hospital any longer than you need to be. Yeah. Yeah. And that's you know, yeah. that's become more and more common yeah. these days. They they yeah. want you. They want to keep those beds free. Yeah. Freed up, and uh, insurance companies they don't want to pay for your time in the hospital any longer than you know needed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, there's a video that I did where I discussed the potential connection between pedophilia and uh, and circumcision. Um, have you ever had any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I have a lot of thoughts on that. I don't know how deep I want to go into that, but okay. I definitely think. Um, cir circumcision can cause, you know, all sorts of behavioral problems, and that includes sexual uh, problems as well. Uh, definitely includes, you know, extreme, uh, I don't know, fetishes or things like that, that you are trying to make kind of make up for the lack that you have, like the lack of bodily autonomy. Um, you know, kind of creates a environment where you're you're always trying to get back what you you lost, and that can kind of come out in a lot of different dysfunctional ways. So I'll probably just leave it at that. But I that's kind of my thoughts on it. Yeah. Yeah. I, for me, I, I um, if you can look at my channel sometime, but um, I my thought was um, this this has become a very common very frequent um this actually goes to jessica pin again um women getting labiaplasty and, and reconstructive surgery after um, having babies and stuff like that to have a more tight vagina yeah um question is why do men so frequently particularly in the u.s feel the need to have a tight vagina be because oh yeah they're well, they're, something. they won't feel it they won't feel anything yeah yeah because yeah. they don't have their own you know their own parts to help give them pleasure yeah <laughs> right yeah so that might lead to desires to have right. a tight vagina which you know yes. yeah. young girls have right young girls that haven't had babies so yeah that's just a theory of mine. I, you know, <laughs> I have no data yeah. to back it up with, or whatever. But you know, I think that's a, a positive I think it's, theory, right? I don't know. It's pretty, pretty easy to do your own thinking and come to your own conclusions. But I would say it would be great to have more research on mm -hmm. early childhood trauma. Yeah. You know. What I worry about though is that even if we did do research or whatever. Um, would it get squashed because i've i've heard of multiple yeah. cases where things have been found out that are horrible about this 
or find out that this is horrible um, yeah. and the studies or whatever get thrown away or hidden or squashed or whatever. I think Gregory Malchuk had an interesting comment the other day. He said, like, just the fact that we need information or appeal to authority to even have an opinion on this, I think is a big problem. It's like, if this is just basic parenting instinct, you know, yeah. that we should have as a culture to not uh, do these things. So I don't think any... I don't like that we would even need research to stop this, but I don't know, maybe it would help some people if they were more scientifically aware of the trauma, because I'm sure it is very easy to prove, you know, it doesn't take much. Yeah. As you said, it's very hard to get that information out. Well, also the question is, is even if we found more data or whatever that proved that this is horrible, I, I don't think that we need it. I mean, there's plenty of data there's that shows that exactly. this is horrible. There's um, more than that. Will the mainstream media take it and run yeah. with it? Um, yeah, you, or will you they can't rely on be quiet you about can't it? rely on an external source to protect your own child. You yeah. just can't. Yeah. All right. So the next thing under relationships is doctor-patient relationships. Now, for myself, um, because doctors are still performing this stuff, um, and and are not getting taught about this, I have a lack of trust for doctors. Because yeah. if they aren't being honest or aren't learning about this, this particular topic, what else are they yeah. skipping out on or, or yeah. being um, untrustworthy about? Absolutely. I, I have, because my parents were doctors, also my mom had cancer at a young age. Um, I've always had a lot of health problems, been been to tons of doctors for, you know, uh, therapists and physical problems. And like you said, they're just, they're not educated on a lot of topics, not just circumcision, but all sorts of health topics they're not educated on. And uh, they have no incentive to become educated because they uh, they're basically pharmaceutical salesmen. When when they sell those drugs, um, they make money. So and they create side effects which require you to come back more. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a huge cycle. So yeah, I'm a big like a believer in taking care of your health as much as possible uh, on your own and becoming educated on you know diet and exercise and any sort of natural natural healing. And I do think there are good doctors out there, but the majority of them, uh, they don't take insurance. You have to pay out of pocket. And I think it's, it is important if you are going to the doc doctor to get second opinions, second and third and fourth opinion, and no. try to find a doctor that you do trust and who's willing to listen to you. Because a lot of doctors will just, they won't even listen to you. You'll, you'll come in, you'll say you're having symptoms and they just won't believe you or whatever crazy reason they have to just get you out of that room. And you have to, if you're not aware of how the medical system works, it's easy to get trampled on. So you, you really have to be an advocate for yourself when you're dealing with the medical system. Yeah, yeah. it's sad, but hey, that's true across the board. I mean, you take your car yeah. and go on mechanic, you know, do you know how much yes. you trust that mechanic? <laughs> and I think most people who do trust doctors uh, blindly, they probably haven't really had much experience with them. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's sad to say I, I trusted them too much myself. Yeah. 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 Okay, then the last thing, um, which we kind of touched on earlier, is friends and family. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a, in a world where general cutting wasn't a thing, there wouldn't be any reason for this to come up and be any kind of wedge between. Yeah. You know, between yeah. Us. yeah. I was actually talking with that to my wife today. I'm just like, life is so difficult because there's all of these things that are like, like you said, putting a wedge between us when we're just supposed to be in communities, be happy, be healthy, and uh, supporting each other. But uh, there's such a, a 
I don't know, so much information, such an information war, propaganda, and all this this nonsense that makes it hard to maintain relationships with even your own family. And it, it's it's a tough thing to deal with. So I think you have anything else to say? I mean, your per, do you have any personal uh, um, experiences you want to share about your relationships with friends and family about this topic? Not really. The one thing I would say is that, and I kind of touched on this before, is that it's important. It's important to find people who you can connect with because mm -hmm. your fam, your family doesn't have to be by blood. Like, yeah, you can you can make family anywhere. Um, that's what I think. Yeah, that's what I would encourage people is like, don't don't just settle for people who are not going to acknowledge you. Yeah. Like you you got to find you got to find people who are you can be open with. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's still I, I'm. It makes me sad that I don't have relationships with some friends and family that I used to. Yeah. Because of this issue, they won't talk to me about it or whatever yeah so. yeah it, it's it's hard it's really hard yeah. okay then on to the next thing um so this is fgm female genital mutilation or female mm -hmm. genital cutting or female circumcision however you want to frame it or put it or mm -hmm. whatever um the reason why i have it on here is because i believe and i think a lot of other people believe that the continuation of male circumcision um, contributes, um, perpetrates the continuation of FGM. And you can talk about FGM both from a non-consensual um, side as well as a consensual side. Because there's a, um, <clears throat> there's actually a certain amount of FGM that occurs in the U.S. that is consented to. Supposedly, at least in a certain number of states, there used to be a federal law that got struck down by the Constitution. Um, it used to be against the law at a federal level um, and when it's non-consensual. Non mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on it? So my thoughts on FGM, um, I don't know. Like, do you, have, you want to rephrase the question at all, or? So it's more not just about thoughts on FGM, but more on how male circumcision is connected to or perpetrates mm -hmm. the continuation of FGM. Um, I think it's a slippery slope when you allow, um, you know, when you allow that into a society, it's always going to be a slippery slope as to what's next. Um, I don't know if that's the best way to worry. The only real thoughts I have on FGM though is that I feel as if people kind of just go along with whatever the authorities tell them. So they, they kind of grow up and they, you know, they hear about these organizations with against FGM and with whatever the WHO rejects it and all that. Mm -hmm. So they, of course, they believe that it's bad. But if they but if they say oh circumcision's a okay, uh, they don't question that either. So what I've kind of come to realize is that just because people are quote unquote against FGM, they're not really educated at all. They kind of just that they were just told that, so that's what they believe. Yeah. If so that's, that's the same. That's the same case whether you're talking about male circumcision or yeah female so, circumcision or even yeah. intersex normalization surgeries. Mm -hmm. So if society supported FGM, all of those people that support circumcision would probably support that as well. Um, so I don't know. I feel like uh, there's a huge barrier just to get people educated. And I like even on FGM, people need to be educated because although they might say, yeah, that's, that's wrong, they may not have a lot of good reasons as to why that it's wrong, but they may not be educated on any, anything about it. So I don't know, that's, uh, in terms of like allowing, continuing to allow child abuse, like living in a culture where that's accepted, I think uh, creates just all sorts of problems. Also, I think it creates, you know, increased suicide, increased drug addiction, 
you know, all these relational problems that we're talking about. It's just kind of, it's a big black hole in society. It's a big, big like mark on society. And uh, it's, it's almost impossible to like calculate all the damage that it, that it causes. So we, we've talked about, you know, could cause pedophilia, could cause mm -hmm. increased rape, you know, all, all sorts of horrible things. So I don't know, that's kind of where I would leave it. Okay. Uh, so that kind of leads on to the, the last thing. Um, you were talking about damages to society. Um, I added social protect productivity, social productivity to this lesson. You actually, in your um, intact radio show that you did, you actually brought this up a little bit. And I, I, I kind of point this out multiple times. Um, it's kind of ironic that part of the idea of cutting off part of the genitalia is to help people focus on being closer to God or being more productive, going back to work and, you know, and just focusing on, you know, go make the baby and then get back to work, you know, type of thing or, or yeah. slavery, you know, um, you know, sometimes people even call, you know, the market of the slave, um, you know, the idea is to, you know, get them to focus on work and not, uh, not on, you know, sexual activities or whatever by cutting out part of the genitalia to reduce sexual drive. Yeah. Yet there's guys like you and I that have become less socially productive, less yeah. not working as well, or, you know, or yeah. we, we get depressed or whatever right. um, because of this. So we're not working as much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for me, for me personally, I feel like I would be much more productive if I was whole and normal and I would be more motivated to have a good life and work hard. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if that's the normal or the, uh, I don't know if I'm in the minority concerning that. Uh, like my dad, my grandpa, I mean, they just, they just worked nonstop and they never thought about it for one second. So. Um, but if you, I think if the book Marked in Your Flesh has a lot of good historical information on the people who promoted circumcision or like the real circumcision, the full circumcision, you could say, the modern day circumcision. Uh, they had all sorts of thoughts on what that would cause uh, socially and behaviorally in men. And it's really shocking when you read some of those early historical writings uh, about how they viewed the, the topic. So I, I would suggest that if you really want to learn more about that, you, you uh, read Marked in Your Flesh and read some of the excerpts from the uh, early circumc uh, circumcision promoters. And when I say early, I mean like ancient thousands of years ago, what they were what their thoughts were on it i just happen to have the book yeah yeah <laughs> there it is yeah so for those of you that want to read this is a good book marking your flesh yeah. by it's leonard a long B. Book. there's a lot of information in that book yeah and he uh, he happened to show up on the uh, american circumcision documentary too yeah I got a whole library of books now <laughs> on the topic. Nice. <laughs> I've lot, got a lot of reading to do. So, yeah. yeah. So, but imagine, you know, if uh, if this general cutting thing wasn't happening in the world, what we would be doing with our time instead? You know, yeah. Doctors would be spending more time healing people. Yeah. <laughs> and guys like yeah. you and I would be spending more time, I don't know, making cars or fixing up computers yeah. or writing great computer software, yeah. you know, who knows? Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah we got to spend all our time with this. Yeah. Hey, but it is what it is. Like, this is where we're at and this is this is what needs to be done. So, yeah. like, I, I, I even had my mom tell me once, she's like, you shouldn't focus on it so much, but it's just like, maybe this is exactly what I need to be focusing on. Because if we're not, if we're not past this as a society yet, maybe it takes a whole lifetime of, you know, toiling over this issue to move past it, unfortunately. Yeah. 
it's not the way I would want it, but it, it is what it is. Yeah, I think that if uh, if general cutting in the world stopped yesterday, then yeah, it'd be great. I'd definitely do something different. You do something else, yeah. But yeah, you know, I keep waking up every morning thinking, well, there's another ten, yeah. some thousand, tens of thousands of children yeah. getting their genitals cut today <laughs> without a medical need. They're getting harmed. Um, I've got to do something about it. I can't. Yeah. Just, I can't not. Intactivists have nothing to gain from doing this work. There's no personal gain from it, other yeah. than other than wanting to stop it happening to someone else. Like, there's not much financial gain. There's not much. No. You know, you just get socially ostracized, and personally, it's very hard. It's a very hard topic to spend all your energy. But uh, yeah. So. It is what it is. Yeah, I work less than I used to. I um, I make less, you know, per hour than I used to. Um, I've dumped five digits of my own money into um, activities and stuff to try to educate people. I even I I have a video that I um, I run as an advertisement on YouTube for uh, attorneys for the rights of the child. Ah. Um, because. I, I, there was, you know, I, I, want, I wanted to keep it short and I wanted to just spike people's thoughts about the topic. And all yeah. it is, is, you know, hey, if you think that you were botched, hey, contact Arkala or something. I was just, you know, something really simple. And I was standing in the blood stain um, outfit and all that. So, you know, just an eye catcher and an ear catcher and, you know, something to get people thinking about the topic. Um, and have sometimes you, I saw you, it, you, know, you need to plant seeds to get people to go, you know, down that rabbit hole. Have you seen the circumcision as a broad YouTube video? Oh yeah. Yeah, that that's a good that's a good video. Yeah. Yeah. It's really um, short. I was like, man, there's like hundreds of billions of dollars in uh, like I don't know. I don't know the word malpractice lawsuit or whatever, however you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it, who knows? I, hopefully, maybe this will be the next, uh, you know, huge lawsuit like what happened with the. Uh, Jordan keeps bringing it up the, um, the cigarette companies, you know. Yeah. But it's you know, it's a little different. You can't just um, sue a handful of cigarette companies. You have to. I mean, who are you going to sue? I don't know. I mean, tens of thousands of doctors. <laughs> Yeah, a whole bunch of hospitals across the world, or yeah. the country, or whatever. I don't know how. There's no lawsuit would be written up. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know if you've how much you've um, checked in uh, to me, but um, I've got a blog uh, about. But there's three things that I did um, about this issue for my for my own case. First, I started off with writing a um, a criminal complaint and filed it with the sheriff's department of the county where I was born, which ended up getting just passed on to the um, the Navy. Because um, that's, I guess they don't have any authority on the Navy grounds where the Naval Hospital was. And then I filed a, a tort claim against the Navy. And of course they, you know, they shot that down or whatever for particularly because it's like, well, you only get two years. It's like, well, two years after it happened, I was not even two years old. So <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not gonna happen. That's not realistic. Um, and then I took it to federal court and uh, filed a federal uh, court claim and uh, gave a judge and, um, and the uh, federal prosecutor or federal, uh, not federal prosecutor, the federal, um attorney um some work to do <laughs> uh you can look at the my blog article and there's uh you can look at the the paperwork that came out of that hat and all. you can you can clearly tell that there was definitely some work put into it so i definitely yeah. created i created a little bit of pain um i was hoping that maybe that would go up the chain somehow and maybe they would rethink about doing this in um in military hospitals because like I, I, as far as i understand like in australia they stopped allowing the procedure in um 
publicly funded hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, it still happens in that country, but it's not it's not done by by their their government. So the government is out of it that way. Whereas in the U.S., our government is involved, not officially from the looks of it, but they are. I, I, mean, yeah. I haven't found anything that says, yeah, this is allowed or this is required or anything um, in within the federal government uh, or federal federally funded hospitals. So my uh, my next attempt uh, after that was to reach out to the inspector general's office and I've suggested to several others to also write to the inspector general's office and ask that they stop the waste of our tax dollars on doing this procedure with yeah. federally funded hospitals. Yeah. So, I mean, that would be a step forward, right? I mean, if some good insurance does not cover it. Yeah, most, uh, many states do not cover it uh, on their, you know, on the state funded insurance, which is good. Um, and that, that seems to be going back and forth. And Taction had to do with, or tack, has started tackling, a, I think, North Carolina issue. On that recently because someone tried to sneak it into the bill i don't know exactly what the status of that is but um yeah it's, it's you know it it should infuriate everyone whether you're you know unless you're really pro sort and think that really you know the medical benefits are all that great um that tax dollars is going towards that procedure yeah something that's effectively a cosmetic procedure. Right. And I can understand maybe a, um, like fixing a cleft lip, but to me, that's a, therape a therapeutic procedure. It's not just um, cosmetic alone. Yeah. Because you're fixing something that is, you know, a birth defect. Right. Foreskins are not birth defects. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, David, well, you got anything else to, to add to this? Yeah, I think that was good. Okay. I appreciate you uh, having me on. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, David. Okay. Have a great night. Yeah. Have a good night. Thank you.